This podcast is brought to you by HEC Paris. Dr. Yunus, HEC is extremely proud to host you tonight and the way this room is filled shows our enthusiasm for your presence here. On behalf of all of all HSE students and alumni, thank you very much for giving us some of your time and sharing your knowledge with us. The conference will be articulated into two parts. The first one focusing on the birth of microcredit and the history of the Grameen Bank. And the second part emphasizing the perspectives uh, for microcredit in the future. Professor Yunus. You created the Grameen um, Bank project almost 30 years ago in 1976. Since then, the bank has been profitable almost every year. And today, um, the bank serves almost uh, 5 million borrowers um, with 10,000 families escaping poverty every month. Could you, please, could you please explain us how you created and developed um, an organization which is a financially profitable uh, and at the same time uh, dedicated to support poor people? Well, I'm very delighted to be here. I'm very happy to see so many young people uh, coming in this evening to uh, listen to our uh, dialogue. Uh, I'm happy because uh, <clears throat> I feel very uh, inspired when I talk to young people because a lot of the things that I do uh, makes immediate sense to young people much faster than the uh, people of my own age. Something is wrong, we can't communicate. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> you ask me, how did it all begin? Uh, <clears throat> and I was teaching in uh, one of the universities in Bangladesh. Bangladesh became independent in 1971. It uh, separated out of Pakistan through a, a lot of bloodshed, civil war, and so on. So it's a devastated country in 71. I was teaching economics in uh, one of the American universities, Tennessee State University, and came back to Bangladesh because I thought this would be a good time to go back to Bangladesh to rebuild the country after so much devastation. And I did. <clears throat> But uh, instead of the country moving forward, it was sliding down very quickly. Economy started sliding down very quickly. In 1974, we had a terrible famine in the country. People were dying of hunger. And it's not a very pleasant thing to see people dying of hunger everywhere around. And you, as a university teacher, teaching beautiful theories of economics, uh, telling everybody that uh, everything you want to know about economics, all the solutions you want to figure out, it's all here. But you walk out, all you see is problems, no solutions at all. So we kind of a big uh, distance between what we talk in the classroom and what we see outside. So I thought something terribly wrong in the kind of things we talk about. <clears throat> And there must be some way to help people who are dying of hunger. So I thought, let's, let me forget about all those things that I teach. Why don't I go out in the village next door to the university campus and act like just another human being and um, try to see if you have any, anything to offer, anything to be of any use to anybody who in the village. So I did those uh, every day, went around talking to people trying to see if there's something that I can do for one individual. I, I realized that no matter what we talk about, five-year development plans and all those big things in the classroom, uh, the real people there are uh, not waiting for those things, just for a survival of another day. So along the way, I saw how people suffered for not having <coughs> access to tiny little money. And they had to go to the loan sharks to borrow that. And I thought, this is uh, incredible. Why people have to suffer so much for such a small amount of money? So I, I wanted to find out how many people like, them, like this there are in the village. 
So I took a student of mine, went around in the village for several days to make a list. And when my list was complete, there were 42 people on my list. The total money they borrowed from money lenders was $27. And I couldn't believe that people had to borrow less than a dollar and with exorbitant interest rate and a lot of other conditionalities. So I'd, I thought I knew everything about Bangladesh. I had, didn't realize that this is so bad that I never knew. So my first instinctive response was to give this money out of my own pocket and go around taking the list, give this money to the people, saying that return the money to the money lenders and take it, keep it, and continue the work that you do when you don't have to take orders from the money lenders. And I thought this would be something that I'll move on to something else. But I, did, I couldn't because of the excitement it created in all those 42 families. They thought it was a miracle. Unbel people couldn't believe that anybody would do something like that. And looking at it, I said, if you can make so many people so happy with such a small amount of money, why shouldn't you do more of it? So it was again an instinctive question that came to my mind. And I was thinking how to do more of it. And then I thought maybe I should link the people with the bank located in the campus. So I went to the bank to suggest to them, why don't you lend money to the people in this village? Bank immediately said, ah, oh, it cannot be done. Bank cannot lend money to the poor people. And it went on and on, arguing for that. And I was uh, trying to convince them that it's a fair thing to do and so on. It didn't work. So it went on for months negotiating with the bank. They will not agree. So I offered myself as a guarantor. I said, I'll become the guarantor. Sign all your papers and you give the money. Finally, after another two months of running around, writing things, and finally they agreed and we took the money from the bank and gave it to people. And it worked. Bank was saying it will never work. You can say goodbye to your money. This money is not going to come back. I said, I'll try. I don't know anything about it. I never did it. I did it and came up with some simple ideas, used it, and it worked. I was very excited. But the bank was not. Bank was totally unimpressed. They said, oh, so what? You have done it in one village, and one professor in one village can do all kinds of funny things. <laughs> so who cares for that? So I said, then how would you be persuaded? He said, at least do it in two villages. It don't work. I said, let me do two villages. So I did it in two villages. It worked. And then he says, well, one village and two villages are the same thing. <laughs> I said, then? He said, you should do at least in five villages. So I did it in five villages. It worked. So every time it works, he raises the number of the village. So I thought maybe this time he will be persuaded. So I go ahead and do it. And he changes the mind, he changes the number. After I have done it 50 villages, 60 villages, then I say, realize that even if I do the whole world, he will not change his mind. Because it's his mindset, he cannot get out of the mindset. And ever since, I have see, I've been seeing how mindset plays a difficult role in doing things differently. So that's why when I said it's so much easier for me to talk to the young people, because young people still ha doesn't have that mindset yet. But as older people like us, the minds are made. It's, a, it's impossible to unmake them. You come up with arguments after arguments to change people's mind. Even if you see very clearly in front of you, you don't change your mind because you're used to what you, is, what you are used to. Anyway, then I thought maybe I shouldn't even try to convince them anymore because it's, it's a, not going to work. The thought, new thought that came to my mind, why don't I create a bank just for the poor people? Then I started working on that idea. And I went to the government to get the permission. Government thought it's a crazy idea to have a bank for the poor people. Never heard of it. It doesn't exist anywhere in the world. Why should you do it? I said, because it works. Because in the whole world, People don't lend money to the poor people. I are good with them. In the whole world, more than two-thirds of the population of the world are not even eligible to go to a bank. Forget about getting any money. 
So I said, this is unfair banking system because it doesn't work for the people. I said, I should create a bank like that. And after two years, I got the permission and got the bank in 1983, and they started expanding it. Everybody said it will collapse. It didn't collapse. And everybody's since then waiting for it to collapse because it doesn't make sense to them. But the more we do it, the more successful we become. We became nationwide. It is, the idea has started spreading around in the world, and other countries started picking it up. In the beginning, the argument is it may work in Bangladesh. It will not work anywhere else. Bangladesh is a very funny country. <laughs> Any funny thing works there. So I said, maybe, because uh, I have no other example. But I was arguing that it will work anywhere in the world because people need money. Banks do not open their door to the people. So we have to have another kind of banking. And then one country after another country started picking it up. Malaysia was the first country who imitated this and replicated it, and it worked in Malaysia. And people say, ah, it's in, works in only in Muslim country. <laughs> <laughs> so I cannot answer that. Then Philippines did it. I said, no, you can't, <laughs> you can't say that anymore because Philippines is doing it, and it's working very well. Then they said, ah, maybe in Asia. It's an Asian thing. <laughs> Uh, then it is spread, suddenly it is spread in the United States because uh, Governor Bill Clinton, who was in Arkansas, he became very fascinated with the idea. He invited me to come and start the program in Arkansas. And out of that came the BRIC program in Arkansas. So I was very happy that uh, it's not only in Bangladesh, the poorest country in the world, it works in the richest country in the world. So I could argue more forcefully, I thought. Uh, but it's still so difficult to convince people to do that because it is uh, uh, almost the reversal of the conventional banks. Conventional banks are based on the principle, the more you have, the more you get. If you have nothing, you get nothing. If you have little, you don't get anything. So we reverse that principle. We said, if you have less, you get our attention. But if you have nothing, you get the highest priority. I thought that's a genuine thing to do. People don't have money. They are the one who is the first one to get the money. So we reversed that principle. And then we eliminated the collateral. No guarantee. No legal papers. Nothing. So people say, how do you do that? I mean, if what if they don't pay you back? I said, why should I worry about it? Every time I give the money, money comes back. So today, after 30 years... When we give over half a billion dollar worth of Bangladeshi money every year, it comes back 99% on time with over 5 million borrowers and people changing their life by investing this in income generating activity. Ever since, one of the big problems I faced was people say, why are you giving money to women? They don't know anything. <laughs> I said, yes, that's what they told me. Every time we try to give it to give the money to women, we go and try to talk to her. She literally runs away from us. She thinks something scary thing is coming to her. She keeps on begging. She keeps on arguing that please don't give money to me because I don't know anything. Please don't give money to me because I never touched money in my life. It's my husband who handles it. Why don't you give it to him? I don't want to create trouble for my family by taking money and getting into trouble. So this was the starting point, but we never lose our heart. We said this is, I started explaining to my colleagues, my, actually they're my students who are working with me, explaining to them, whatever you hear from them, don't believe what they say. Because they are saying something which about their history. They're not talking about themselves, which is buried under history. So you have to peel the history off, bring out the person. Because it's a centuries of beliefs, centuries of things that you are no good, you are use, un, useless, you have no capacity. I am the man, I'm taking care of it. I know how to handle things. So this is what she believes. She, that's how that tradition created her. So you have to undo this whole thing. It's not an easy process. So if you listen to her, I don't know anything, and you walk out, you are submitting to the history. You, are not, you, are, you continue the history. You do not challenge the history. You do not stop the history. 
I have gone through many sessions of this discussion with women myself, trying to convince them that you can do something. I don't want to go on elaborating the kind of nature of discussion that I had to do, just to make them believe they can do something. One usual question, just to give an example, just one usual question. I would say, is there anybody who cook? Among all, these are all women sitting in front of me. They all laugh. Of course we all cook. That's the only thing we do. <laughs> then my next question, then why did you say you didn't know anything? You know how to cook. Oh, no, no, we mean we don't know how to make money. There's nothing that we can do. I said, well, you can cook and sell. Did you think about that? Is there anyone who cooks very well? Ah, oh, she cooks very well. Her cakes are so good. Her this dish is so good. I said, okay, she can take money and make more and sell it. Then you know what they would say? No, you don't sell food. Food you give people to eat. You don't sell it. I said, does your husband bring any food for your children? Some cookies, some candies from the market? And some say, yes. Didn't somebody sell it to your husband? And your children are eating that? And you ate that? Well, that's for the market. I said, yes, that's what I'm saying. You make it and go. <laughs> so it's a strange kind of argument. The re why did we have to do it to the women? Why are we so uh, involved with women? Very simple reason. Right from the beginning, I'm saying banking system is wrong because it denies its services to a large segment of human population, poor people, low-income people. So this has to be changed. So we can design a bank which can do that. And then second one I said, banking system is wrong. It denies all women access to banking system. And our bankers would got so mad at me. Why do you say that? We want to give loans. They don't take it. I said, that's not true. I said, even if you can show me at least 1% of the borrowers of all your banks, 1% are women. I will withdraw my remarks. I would say, you are great guys. You are absolutely super, giving 1% women. They don't have 1%. Even today, they don't have 1%. This is 70s that I'm arguing. So when I began, I wanted to make sure half the borrowers in my program are women. I thought that is justice, that is evenness. That's it. But then I go to the women, women say, no, no, don't give it to me, give it to my husband. So we worked and worked and worked for six years to bring it to the 50-50. Then when we reach 50-50, men and women, we are so excited that finally we made it. Everybody said it don't work. Finally we did it, and now it works. Then we started noticing money that goes to the family through women brings so much more benefits to the family, same amount of money, than the money going to the family through men. If you lend money to women, immediately children become the beneficiary, absolutely guaranteed. You can compare family by family, you'll see the same thing. You know, it's an amazing similarity after, after what we have seen over years. In the first place, we thought this was a Bangladeshi phenomenon. But later on, we see it's a global phenomenon. Today, when you say microcredit, nobody has to spell it out. Basically, it's a lending money to poor women. That's what the microcredit is all about. Everybody else forgot about the man because it works so well with the women because you get so much more mileage out of that money. People say, is, it, is there a real difference? I said, okay, of course. Did you know that if in, in the whole history of mankind, you go anywhere in the world, it doesn't matter whether you're in Asia, whether in Europe, whether it's in Latin America, whether in Africa, it's the same story. A man gets his wage money at the end of the week, takes the money, and where does he go? He goes to the pub. <laughs> right away. Have you ever heard anywhere a woman got her check on money packet and went to the pub and blew her money? Never heard of it. A man gets his money, payments, he goes to a prostitute. A woman, have you ever heard? <laughs> Nothing. So you go case by case, it's a universal phenomenon. You, you read storybooks, novels, and everything. Same stories. So anyway, we focused on them. So we changed our policy of 50-50. We said no more 50-50. No more we focus on women because it works so much better. Today, 96% women. 
and it works so much better with them. We have been encouraging them to send their children to school because these are all illiterate women, all illiterate men in the family. Don't read, don't write. Universal. But we thought if you want to change things, maybe we should encourage them to send their children to school. So right from the beginning, we encouraged them to send them to children to school, and they have been sending them. Today, 100% of the children of all these five, over 5 million families are in school. And what happened over years, many of them, many, many children out of these families now graduated from high school. They are in colleges. Many are universities, in medical schools, engineering schools. Almost in every single medical school, in every single engineering school in Bangladesh and universities, there are some Grameen family students enrolled in those and learning there, coming from totally illiterate families. So again, a quite a sharp break from the tradition, from the continuation of the history of the first generation. You make a second generation totally different out of that. And this is because their own initiative. People were saying they are illiterate, they won't do. They will not know how to use the money. I said, all human beings are entrepreneurs because they said they don't have the risk-taking capacity. I said, these are only what you have written in your books, but the people are different. People are very energetic, very creative. There's limitless, limitless potential in every single human being. All we need to do is to just to open that, just to give them the taste of that creativity in them because never in history they had the taste of their own creativity. Once they taste their creativity, they will be completely different people. And that's exactly what is happening. So this is the generation, new generation coming up. So what we did after seeing the children moving up, so we started giving scholarships. Grameen Bank not only lends money to people, it also gives a scholarship to the children of their families. And then we introduced the student loan. If you're in higher education, your parents may not be able to fund, finance you all through. Don't worry. Your parents own this bank. The Grameen Bank is owned by the borrowers. It's not a bank owned by me or anybody else. The bank owned by all those five million borrowers that I'm talking about. And so we give student loans so that you continue with their education. Now today they are in different levels. So this is how the uh, progression of the Grameen Bank started. One, little, one more point and I'll stop. One criticism continued with us for a long time. People saying, well, after seeing what we do, the impact it made, people how move out of poverty with their own efforts, and banks make profit. It's a wonderful thing. You can have the cake and eat it too kind of situation. So if poverty is such an uh, unmanageable problem that you cannot attack, here is something which works. It doesn't cost anybody any money, and they change their life. What a wonderful solution. Aha. Uh -huh. There's some catch to it. It works, they said, only at the top layer of the poor people. If you go to the middle level of the poor people, it don't work. If you go to the bottom layer of the poor people, it don't work. Why? Because they don't have the entrepreneurial capacity, because they don't have the risk-taking capacity, because they don't have the skill to use money. And Well, when you allow the educated people to write pages, they write pages. I mean, it goes on and on and on explaining all this. I said, forget it. We have been lending money to the extremely, extremely poor people. It always worked. We have never distinguished between extremely poor person and a slightly less poor person. They all pay the same. That's why we get 99%. You see, you have been telling us that it don't work with the women. It worked with the women. So what is the deal? But the question, the criticism doesn't disappear. Because they, they said, wonderful idea, microcredit, but it works this way. It doesn't work, go down. So two years, or two and a half years back, we thought we must address this issue once for all and get it clear. So we came up with the idea, why don't we give loan exclusively to beggars? You can't be poorer than beggars. If poor people can take money and pay you back, and change their life in the process. Isn't that enough of a demonstration that everybody is a creative person? Then we sat down and my colleagues keep asking me, how do we do it? Okay, we'll give loans to the beggars, but what is it? Other people buy cow and sell milk and pay back. What is these beggars going to do? Can you explain to us? 
I said, let's look at this way. Why don't we go sit down with the beggars? Talk to them. Because after all, it's their life. And we can talk to them. You go from house to house to seek some rice. Because rice is a Bangladeshi staple. So if you collect enough rice from house to house for the meal, you come back and cook it and feed it your family. And for next meal, you go out, or next day, you go out, collect some rice, and come back and cook it. So our message with them was said, after we listened, after we heard, sympathized, we said, okay, as you go from house to house, would you care to carry some merchandise with you? Some cookies, some candies, some toys for the kids? You are going there anyway. I mean, this is how you beg. So all you have to do, in case you want to do, is to carry something to sell. In the beginning, people say, what if they don't buy? I said, well, there's no problem. They didn't buy. Still, you have the product left with you. And you can try the next day, if they work. And they said, well, why not? We can do that. In the beginning, we thought we will have about 3,000, 4,000 beggars in our program. But it became such a popular program. Today, we have 51,000 beggars in the program. And that because we put the restriction that is one staff of Grameen Bank cannot take more than four beggars in its capacity. Initially started with one beggar per staff, restricted. But our staff got so excited by the result of it, they kept pleading, please allow us to take 10. I said, no, 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 stay with one. Then we allowed two. Finally, in the last uh, about three months back, we allowed them four. So we are moving into four times the number of staff. We are 51,000 right now because of the restriction we put. Why do we put restriction? We said all we have to show today that they are paying back and they are changing their life. And today, many, nearly over 1,000 of them who started early, they quit completely. And we said if you can, sh if you can demonstrate that 10,000 of them have moved out of begging and now in a selling business, they would be fantastic. Then we'll say we can do it. But so far, they are doing it so good. So anybody can move in and find out. And the loan they take, the beggars take per person, is in the range of about $3, $4, $5, maximum $12, $15. That's it. Nothing more than that. So if you, your loan of $10 can change a beggar into a dignified salesperson, why aren't we doing that? And the question was, that would that survive? It's not a question. Today, we can say with authority, it's not a question of survival. They are developing the whole thing. We didn't bet for it, but what we see now, some of the beggars, not only selling things, they are collecting shopping lists from the families and come to the market and buy things and deliver it. Because in Bangladesh, for women to go to the market is very difficult. You have to tell your husband to bring something. And husbands are husbands. They forget <laughs> all the time. So they found out a new way, new agents of shopping. <laughs> they give the list, and she brings whatever you want is. So they are happy, and they are making the pubs. So this is another demonstration how our thoughts can stop our own actions. If you think differently, things are different. Thank you. I have just a very small question. Um, you have been saying that um, you were encouraging your customers, borrowers, owners, to send their children to school, universities, colleges. Um, and you also asked them to abide by certain rules, including um, banning dory, um, promoting hygiene. My question would be, is this banking system an economic tool as well as a social tool? This is supposed to be a very small question. <laughs> very big one. <laughs> well, uh, the more difficult than dowry, what we are facing right now, is, uh, recent one that is developing. These young people going to universities, occasionally I meet with a group of them to discuss their ideas about their future and what they want to do about themselves. 
after we discussed <clears throat> for half a day about lots of different things, <coughs> on one occasion, they will wait to ask this question. That you have been so wonderful to come in bank to help us go to school. Now we are in university, we are in medical schools, we'll become doctors, we'll become engineers, and so on. But where are the jobs? When we come out, will you help us find jobs for us? Because you have done everything else. So I have been hearing this so many times, so I came up with my answer. So today, whenever I, I know that in this meeting, this question will come sooner or later. So I, whenever that question now comes, my answer is like this. I said, yes, I understand your worry about the future. But as children of Grameen family, I would like this for you to consider and keep in mind that as a Grameen Bank child, as a Grameen Bank son or a daughter, my commitment, my promise to myself, pledge to myself, would be something like this. I shall never work for anybody. Never. I will give a job at least to one person. And every morning you wake up, you say that. I'm not going to ask for a job from anybody. I will create a job for at least for one person. And all the kids in front of me get stuck. Say, no job, what am I going to do? <laughs> what do I do? <laughs> so I said, yes, you're wondering, then what do you do if no jobs? How do you create a job for somebody else? I said, look, other kids are waiting for jobs. Probably you, they influenced you. But there is a different from, difference between the other kids and you. Your mother owns a bank. Other kids' mother don't own a bank. So that's a big difference. All you have to do is to figure out what is the enterprise that you are going to do. Because money is not your problem. Bank has plenty of money to give you. Question is, what is the idea that you want to use? Your mother is using money from Grameen Bank. And you have seen it every day, how she uses that money. Now you have gone to school. You have learned a lot more things that your mother never learned. What is good about that if you can't do a business better than your mother? So think about that. When you start a business, of course you'll be employing other people. And that will be your success. So think about that. This is a challenge. So always remember that I'm son of a Grameen Bank family or I'm a daughter of a Grameen Bank family, my task is to create a job, not to ask for a job. I'll never work for anybody, and that's it. They are not persuaded, of course. <laughs> but I keep on repeating that, and I believe in that. The reason I believe in that, the reason I keep repeating that, if I have talked to thousands of them, I know for sure 10 of them will do that. Hundred of them will do that, and that will be an instance. So look, they did it. Why couldn't you? You are a doctor. You could go and do your own profession. You are an engineer. You are a prof uh, you are a master's in this subject or that. So you can do something better than anybody else. So be an entrepreneur like your mother, rather than being a job seeker and wait for a line or send applications after applications, and you don't get a job because there is not too many things for jobs. So this is one thing keeps repeating. And you ask me social part and the economic part. Uh, let me quickly add that I have been challenging the very concept of business all the time. I'm challenging by saying that the way the, we have defined, the conceptualized the business, I think is an extremely narrow interpretation of business. That interpretation of business is the business to make money. Human being is much grander than making money. Making money is only one piece, little piece of human being, not the all part. The way economic theorists, economic framework presented human being, that tiny little bit they blew up as if that's the whole human being and said business is always to make money. Then you're not 
addressing the other parts of the human being. The same human being who wants to make money is the same human being who wants to help other people, same human being who wants to sympathize with other people, empathize with other people, and so on. What about those parts? So I said at least to begin with, there should be two kinds of businesses. Business to make money, which we are all familiar with, and the other one, business to do good, do good to people. There we are in business, I am in business, not to make money, to good to people. It can be done. I can address any social issue, any problem that we see can be transformed into a business model and then try to address it in a business model. So we come to our work, domain work, microcredit. Microcredit could be done in either way. You can turn microcredit as a money-making proposition, which moneylenders always did. We are not the first one to come. They have been always making money. We, we have loan sharks in our history, in our books, in our, uh, in our uh, literature. So it's always existed. So they are the ones who want to make money by lending money. But what is other one? Other one is to lend money to good to people so that people can create their own opportunity to pull themselves out of poverty and move on, create, bring out their creativity, ingenuity, and their uh, uh, intelligence, and so on. And it can be done. And if you look at Grameen Bank, probably Grameen Bank will fit into that social business enterprise. It's an enterprise which aims at changing people's lives, not making money. It's not designed to make somebody rich. For example, if I started, if I created Grameen Bank, to be owned by me, I don't, I don't think anybody would object to it. Today I'll be making a lot of money. It, it's a very, money, a very uh, exciting money-making machine that we built. But that's not how we built it. Right from the day one, we designed it, this bank will be owned by the borrowers themselves. They don't even know what the ownership is. We told them what the ownership is. What does it mean? They sit in, they sit in the board. Our, the Grameen Bank, which lends half a billion dollar a year, more than half a billion dollar a year, in loans averaging less than $120. And the profit that it makes, all this is owned by the borrowers themselves. So this is a social business enterprise. So we can address anything, any uh, uh, aspect of life in a social business enterprise. So I've been saying that uh, even a business school, like the one that we have right here, business school probably in future when we accept this idea that it can be done that way, will have uh, instead of just plain MBA, there'll be a class which will be producing social MBAs who will be, become the future social business entrepreneurs who will create social businesses to do good to people and leave a signature in the world. This is what I have done. As a young man, as a young woman, I wanted to put my signature in the history of the world, and I did it. This is what I, this piece of the problem, I solved in a business way, and it worked. It's possible. And in order to do that, I'm arguing that maybe this business environment has to be created differently. Because this entire business environment has been created with one idea, to make money. So we have a stock market. We go and buy shares in that stock market. Why do we go to the stock market? We want to make money. That's the whole sole purpose of going to the stock market. So there's no chance in that stock market for social business enterprises. So I said, why don't we create a social stock market where all the social businesses will be listed? When people will walk into that social stock market, they will know why they are going there. They are going there to find out which particular social company is doing in particular area like women empowerment or children uh, out of the street or drug addiction or drinking water or sanitation or uh, healthcare. Healthcare is a big issue. It could be very well addressed in a social business way. It's a, it's a global issue. It's not just a Bangladesh issue. It's not just an Africa issue. It's a global issue. People at the bottom don't get health services. Why aren't we doing something about it? We can run this as a health ser healthcare service, in a social healthcare services, run as a business. So 
we need to have that stock market. And I was even suggesting maybe we should have Social Wall Street Journal, which will be enlisting all those companies and speculating about who is moving up and who is going down and which, one, which new venture is coming up from a young man or a young girl who wanted to do something and here is the grand idea. And there's a social venture capitalist waiting around. They say, here is my money. Go ahead. Do it. If a dot-com companies can have venture capitalists sitting around to support them, why not social business enterprises? And I'm sure there are lots of people who would come up with their money to support these programs. So create a completely new structure. So then the harshness of this, what we call the capitalist world, the harshness of that world, will torn down because you have a social business coming in. So it's a free market. Social business enterprises will be competing with the uh, money-making business enterprises in the same marketplace, and whoever's the winner will take the uh, booty and move on. And creativity, I'm sure, on the side of the social businesses will be much better, much organized, uh, much forceful, because people will be supporting this kind of business in a much warm way than any other kind of business. So it's a, two kinds of businesses. And the same entrepreneur can play on both sides. The same entrepreneur can have investment in the money-making enterprises at the same time in the social business enterprises because that's what he loves to do or she loves to do uh, to do that. So this is the picture. I mean, it has this, you know, it's a business. Business, it makes profit and all that. But profit goes back to the borrowers so that uh, the social aspect is maintained. Our objective in future, like what is the objective of Grameen Bank? What do we see? Just quickly I would add, uh, I cannot elaborate, but uh, see all our branches, we have over uh, 1,600 branches in Bangladesh, where we work. Our branches are graded with the stars. Like, you know, the hotels, Three-star hotel, four-star hotel, five-star hotel. You immediately know what is the difference between a three-star hotel and a five-star hotel. So if you go to our branches, you can ask how many stars you got. Said, we got two stars. And what about you, your branch? We got five stars. So you know there's a difference between two stars and the five stars. What are these stars? Quickly, I'll explain. Each star is color-coded. So by looking at the color of the star, you know what is the accomplishment. If your branch... A branch will be about 4,000 plus borrowers. If your branch has 100% repayment record for the whole year, not 99.9, 100% repayment record, then you get a blue star. So you know they have 100% repayment. That's good. If your branch makes profit, then you get a green star. That your star is a green star, you got that. If your branch runs with its own money, it doesn't take any money from anywhere. It just the, mobilizes the deposits and lends money to the local poor people and sends the surplus deposits to head office or another branch. So it's a surplus branch in terms of its financial resources. So they get another this is a violet star for that. The next two is very interesting. If all the children of these 4,000 plus families are in school, not a single child is out, then you get another star. It's a brown star. So if you have a brown star, green star, blue star, and a violet star, you know what these are for. If all those 4,000 plus families have moved out of poverty completely, not a single family is left behind. Then you get another star, which is a red star, meaning that all your borrowers now are out of poverty. So imagine a five-star branch of Grameen Bank. It has accomplished all the missions of Grameen Bank. So if we can have all those 1,600-plus branches with five stars, imagine what it means. All the borrowers are out of poverty, all the children are in school or finished schools, and they run their own branches with their own money. Their 100% repayment makes profit. That's it. Today, 56% of our borrowers are out of poverty. And our poverty, how we measure that, we every year we monitor that. Very simple thing. What we go we do, there is a 10-point checklist. We go back to the family and see how many 
of those 10 points they have overcome. Does the family have a solid roof over their head so that in monsoon it won't be raining coming down into the house? If they have, you have a tick mark. You've completed that one. If the family members, all of them, can sleep on a bed rather than on the floor, all of them, there's enough of those beds in the house, then you get the second one done. If all the family members have warm clothing, this is very unusual because in Bangladesh, when winter comes, it's a severe winter because everything is open and temperature drops down to as low as six degrees Celsius. Nothing but a piece, piece of cotton cloths, nothing else. So we see you can build up the stock of the warm clothing for children, for everybody. So if all the family members have enough warm clothing for the worst winter, then you get another point. Access to drinking water. Do you have access to drink pure drinking water? It's a tube well or something. If you have, then you get another point. Do you have sanitation for yourself, for the family? Sanitary latrine. If you have a sanitary latrine, you got another one. Do you have enough savings? In our terms, 5,000 taka. It's almost saying 5,000 euro to them. You are in the savings account. More than that. Then if you have... for meeting emergencies. You have. So all these 10 points, if you have done all the 10 points, then we declare this family has moved out of poverty. If one of them is missing, then we still keep on working so that that can be completed. So that's a tough job, having all those five, 10 conditions fulfilled and getting the family out of poverty. So this is how we do that and 56% done. The Millennium Development Goal is to see half the number of poor people getting out of poverty by 2015. And we keep reminding within ourselves, within Grameen families, that our task is make sure before 2015, 100% of all the families of Grameen Bank out of poverty. So that we create a quite an island that look, we have done it here. So that people can think it can be done for the whole world. And I keep saying that poverty is a very absolutely unnecessary thing. It has been imposed on the people. Poverty is not created by the poor people. It's not their fault. Poverty is created by the system that we built, institutions that we have built, policies that we pursue, and the concepts that we created for ourselves. They are the one who created the poverty. I even defined a poor person as a bonsai, you know the Japanese word bonsai, the little tree. You pick the best seed from the forest for the tallest tree and plant it in a flower pot, you get a tiny little tree. Looks exactly like the tree you saw in the forest, but far, far shorter than the one that you saw. What's wrong? Is the seed is different? Seed, something to, wrong with the seed? No, we collected the best seed. Then what went wrong? The pot. We planted in a small pot. It needed a bigger base to grow. So he, poor people are bonsai people. Nothing wrong with the seed. Simply society has not allowed them to grow on the real soil. They were given a small pot. So they grow short, and everybody says, look, this is their fault. It's not their fault. Because they are denied all the opportunities that is available to everybody else. So I'm saying, just open up. Why close the door for the bank? What was the excuse? You have been saying that the poor people are not credit worthy. I said, the real question is whether the banks are people worthy. Why don't we change the banks rather than try to say, change the people to fit us? I said, change the bank to fit them. And it can be done. Because that's what Ramin has done to demonstrate that it can be done. So today we are introducing in the banking itself savings we always had. We had a pension fund. All the borrowers of Ramin Bank have their own pension fund so that when they grow old, they don't have to worry about who is going to support them. Uh, we have uh, insurance program. We have loan insurance. If somebody dies, family doesn't have to pay anything because it's covered by the insurance. We have started, uh, we have done the uh, mutual fund. 
so that you can go to the stock market and buy the shares of big companies by the poor people. We have created a mobile phone company called Grameen Phone, which is the largest mobile phone company in the country. And then we started selling these mobile phones to the borrowers of Grameen Bank. She takes a loan, buys herself a cell phone, and starts a telephone business, sells the service of the phone in the villages, and makes a lot of money by selling the service of a telephone. Today there are more than 170,000 telephone babies all over Bangladesh. But Bangladesh is a country where 70% of the population do not have access to electricity. So how do you take telephones to the villages where there is no electricity? We solved that quickly, we created another company, Grameen Energy. <laughs> so we, we brought the solar energy, we plugged in the solar panel, it works. You don't need a green energy, nothing. So now solar energy is becoming very popular, so we are selling more than 1,500 solar home systems for lighting, for everything, every month. So this is one thing leads to another. People, this is a question of looking at them and they look, see what they are doing and you come and create your business. And Grameen Phone, out of nothing, now today is the largest telephone company, as I mentioned. Not only that, it's also the largest company in the country, among all other companies. So, it works. So this is how you have to take the issue and fit it to your social media. And it works. Thank you. The diploma of uh, uh, Professor Honoris Causa of uh, the group HEC. So at the Dean of the Faculty, I'm very proud to welcome you within the HSS Faculty. Please visit us at www.hec.edu.